Yeah, 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 this is this. Yeah. So, uh, we begin the meeting. Uh, the first panel meeting uh, talk about a powerful partnership. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, my first time in India, so it's, uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, if you wonder why I look a bit, uh, sort of, I have a red face, it's because uh, this stupid white uh, Western tourist uh, went biking yesterday but forgot to put on sunscreen. So the good part is that uh, I contacted the university. They said, okay, we'll, we'll let you keep your PhD for now. So I can still give my talk today, uh, which will be on uh, basically on geometry in complex networks. Uh, it's a talk based on several papers. This is together with all of the authors that are here. You don't have to memorize their names. I'll come back to them near the end of the presentation. And uh, so I have a program that I, that I intend to go through, but if at any point uh, you have a question, something is unclear, please, please stop me and ask me a question because uh, I, I'm always very happy to go into discussion, even if that means that I can't finish what I want, what to have on the slides. All right. So, in general, uh, we're all here because we work on networks, and uh, especially, for instance, me, but many people also work on networks because we, uh, and random graphs because we want to study complex systems or complex networks. And so there are, of course, many different types of complex networks out there. There are technological networks like the internet, there are lots of social networks, even lots of biological networks like the brains or cell-cell interaction networks. And, of course, many, many more types of complex systems that we can model as networks. And in general, how I view this is that the, the goal of studying these, uh, these, these uh, networks is because we want to basically understand, predict, but also potentially control the complex systems that they represent, right? So we try to, we try to understand these systems, we want to predict certain processes on them, and ideally control their outcomes. And the way that uh, we, uh, that for instance, I approach this in my research, but many others also do, probably many of you here, is that we, uh, we use random graph models to build networks that are similar to the networks that we are interested in, and then try to use the, the math behind the random models to be able to say something on one of these topics related to the actual system. And so we use random graphs as models for complex networks, trying to understand, predict, or control them. And today, I want to talk about uh, sort of studying complex networks and building random graph models. And the key star uh, of today is going to be geometry. So, I like geometry a lot. Uh, uh, I'm not the only one. So geometry is also a very important fundamental uh, ingredient in many uh, physical theories, right? Many, uh, many, many physics relies on some form of geometry. Uh, in particular, this is uh, one of the projects later on is basically comes from, from this types of field, right? In, in the field of understanding quantum, quantum gravity, uh, geometry is a very important tool. And even there are even people that are using random graphs to work on a theory of uh, quantum gravity. But of course, geometry also lives outside of the realm of math and physics. So for example, it was already used for a very long time in sociology and psychology, where basically researchers use geometry as a certain latent space to basically group people together that say have similar interests or similar hobbies. So geometry has been around for a very long time, also outside math and physics. And, um, and I, I usually like to use geometry in networks. So what I mean with that is that usually there is some geometric space, whatever it is, and then we want to use the geometry of this space to build models, random graph models that can mimic properties of the networks that we're interested in. And in part one of this talk, I'm going to give you some flavor or some examples of how we can use geometry to build better complex, better random graph models for complex networks. Now, basically, what that means is that in part one, I start, I use geometry and then get a network out of it. So I have an arrow from left to right. Now I can, of course, also draw an arrow from right to left. And then I have to explain what I mean with this. But so what I'm going to do in part two is I'm going to try and go the other way around. So if somebody gave me a network that was constructed using some geometry, I can ask the question, well, can I extract information of this geometry from the discrete structure of the network? It turns out, in certain cases, you can, and this is what I'm going to talk to in part two. So this is the plan for today. So with that, I will go to the first part. So modeling complex networks 
using geometry. So before I want to start, I want to sort of, sort of set the stage here because when I say modeling complex networks, I mean lots of different things. But how I approach this is always as follows. So usually you are given some complex system that you can model as a network and you're interested in studying this system. And usually the system has a certain set of properties that are very important, right? So they are either given, but usually given by domain experts. They say, oh, these properties of this system or the network, those are very important. And then what many people then try to do is we're trying to build a random graph model that has sort of similar properties. But usually what we want is that as the size of our network grows to infinity, right, then the, these properties converge to the, to the specific values of these properties in the complex system. Right? So as, our, as we generate larger and larger uh, networks, they, uh, they return the same kind of uh, properties that the original system has. Now, why do you want to do these asymptotics? That's a, a question you can ask. Well, generally you want to do this because complex networks, are, the networks that we're interested in are often very large. And because they're very large, it actually means that actually asymptotic, uh, asymptotic properties are very good approximations of these properties in very large systems. But actually, more importantly, I would say is because, well, usually limits are slightly easier to study. So if you ask, for instance, theoretical physicists, particular particle physicists, they will tell you they will tell you there are two easy things, very small systems and infinitely large systems. And everything in between is terrible. So th this is why I personally like to study asymptotic properties, because studying asymptotics is usually slightly easier than studying sort of large but finite sized systems. And finally, a nice thing about when you study these asymptotics, right, is you take, uh, take some limits. So you sort of also had these limits are usually robust in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, they, of course, there's no size anymore. So there's some robustness there. But mainly the reason why you want to use sort of these asymptotic analysis is because the actual networks are very large. So you can actually approximate it very well with asymptotics and studying limits is usually easier. But then, then basically that brings us to the main question, okay, so which properties do we want to have in our models? And of course, for any given very specific system, there are a long list of potential properties that you might want, usually dictated by domain experts. But there are also some properties that we see reoccurring in many complex systems. So ideally, we would also like to build random graph models that at least can mimic those properties. And I will give you sort of two or three of those to, uh, today. So the first has to do with degrees in networks. So basically the first property that, uh, that we want to mimic is that many of the complex systems or the networks that we're studying, they are sparse. And in this case, what I mean by sparse, I mean that the empirical average degree in the network, so this is just the degree, so this is the average degree in the network, this converges to some uh, positive number as n goes to infinity. I did not exactly specify what mode of convergence I'm taking, uh, but usually, right, because we're talking about random graphs, you can think of this as convergence in probability. Are you worried about the graph being simple? Or, or? Uh, I'm not, at this point, not worried about the graph being simple, actually, but the models that I'm going to talk about, they will generate simple graphs. But I'm, I'm not posing this as a, as, a, as a property here, but the, they will be simple. So second to being sparse, we often observe something about the degree distribution and uh, uh, have a very sort of popular way to, to say this is say, oh, there are power law degrees, uh, but I'm going to be a bit more uh, explicit. So if we look at the empirical degree distribution, it's just a fraction of nodes of, uh, who have degree K. If you plot this on a log log scale, then for many networks, you see pictures that look like this. And now if you squint your eyes a bit, uh, sort of you, then you can, somehow draw some straight lines uh, over these, uh, over these uh, distributions. And basically what this means, right, is if you ask people in, uh, in network science what this means, they say, oh, this means that this function decays as some inverse power of the degree k. Uh, and this was observed already a long time ago in the 1920s uh, when Lotka was studying, uh, uh, this was one of the first studies of uh, citation networks, he observed this was later picked up again by Price, who also studied citation networks. But then it basically this concept of power law degrees took off in the 1990s when network science also started to bloom and people were finding power laws everywhere. Now, I can give a whole presentation of what it means for degrees to be power laws and why and how you estimate them or, or does it make sense at all to do this. But for now, I'm just going to 
sort of formulate what it is that I, how, what, what sort of the translation is that I'm making. So what I'm doing is instead of looking at the, uh, the probability mass function, I'm going to look at the till distribution. So this is the fraction of nodes whose degree is strictly bigger than K. And what I want to have here is that this function converges to a regularly varying function. Now, regularly varying just means that indeed there's this, uh, this inverse, it decays as an inverse power of K, and then there's a slowly varying function, which can be constant, something converging to a constant, logarithms, powers of logarithms. It's basically to take care of, uh, for example, these kinds of behaviors where you first sort of have this slight decline and then it becomes straight. So this is the property I want for my degree. So I want the tail distribution to converge to a regular varying distribution. Now, and the, the second property that we often see has to do with triangles and communities. So many of the complex systems that we, that we study, they, uh, they have, well, what people would say, they have some communities or they have usually some sort of group structure within the network. So basically what it means that networks sort of look typically like this very stupid little toy example. Uh, and in particular, what we often see is that these networks have many triangles. There are many triangles present in these networks. And so we want to also have this in our, in our random graph models. So in order for that, there are several ways to characterize the number of triangles in the network. So one way is by what is called the local clustering coefficient. So what you do is you take here delta i is just the number of triangles that node i participates in. You normalize it by the maximal number of triangles the node can participate in, in a simple graph. So that's just the degree choose two. So this is a, a, a clustering coefficient for each node, and you just take the average over all nodes in the graph. Now, in addition to that, there's, uh, and then what we want for this, of course, we want that this thing, like the average degree, for example, it converges to some positive number. Now, there's also another way to characterize the clustering, which is a more fine-grained version of this local clustering coefficient. And it's often, uh, I call it the local clustering function. It also goes by the name of the degree-dependent local clustering coefficient. So it's basically the same as this, but now I'm only considering uh, nodes of degree k. So for every k, I'm only looking at the nodes that have degree k. And I then I again look at this clustering coefficient of the nodes. And then, of course, it means that I have to normalize not by n, but by the total number of nodes that have degree k. And that is this n of k. If I want to be very uh, precise, right, I have to include an indicator here that says that there, there is at least one node with degree k, of course, right? And then I have to put this at zero if it's not. But for presentation purposes, I just put this formula like this. So this is a function for every k. And what we usually want, what we then want, of course, is that this function converges to some given limit function. And now, actually, when you study real complex networks, there are actually many cases where this limit function also has some kind of sort of power law behavior. So here is a set of plots that uh, I borrowed from a paper by uh, Clara Steghuis and co-authors who, who studied basically this local clustering function in real networks. And again, you see that basically there is this sort of, this is again on a log plot, there's this type of power law behavior. So what I'm going to postulate then is similar to the degrees, that ideally, I want, I want to be able to have this function be regularly varying as well. So just to summarize, right, so basically for now, and I mean, I can add properties to this as well, right, but I, I don't do this because of the time constraints, but for now, the properties that I want to put into my random graph models are sparsity, power law degrees, and clustering, which is summarized by these two properties. So these are the properties that I want to be able to get out of my random graph models. What is the symbol delta i again? This theta, it is? Delta i. Delta i is the number of triangles that the node uh, participates in. So I, number of triangles i node is Yeah, node i uh, participates in, yes. Sure. Uh, all the nodes in the triangle have k degree here, uh, last one? Uh, sorry, what is the? In this, uh, all the nodes in a triangle that you're counting have k degree uh, yeah, the, the ones here, right, indeed. So here, here I'm summing over all nodes, but I'm only looking, only looking at those nodes of degree k. And then for each of those nodes, I'm looking at how many triangles does it have and then normalize it by the maximal number of triangles. In a triangle with other nodes, which don't have degree k. But no, no, yeah, exactly. So it has degree k, but the other nodes in the triangle can have... And actually, there are many studies. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Clara, to also together with Remco, they studied sort of how these... Uh, how, how, what actually, what is the typical degree of nodes in a triangle if you know the degree of the, the, say, the root node of the triangle? 
All right, so these are the properties that I want to be able to get. So then the question is, okay, how do I construct a model that satisfies all of these properties? Now, I mean, everybody that has studied uh, random graphs for some time knows that there's like, there's a whole zoo of models, right? So, okay, so let's, uh, let's see. So here I want to touch upon sort of, I want to start with a very general and also widely known model. It's called inhomogeneous random graphs. So just to quickly uh, sort of say what the model is, there, there are basically three parameters, n, which is the number of nodes. There's a positive uh, random variable, often referred to as the weight or the type. And there's a connection function, kappa. And how the model works is you take n nodes. To each node, you assign a weight sampled IID from, uh, from, the, from this W. And then every pair of nodes is connected with a probability that is basically the value of this kappa evaluated at their weight and then normalized by n. And now, of course, if you take kappa to be a constant everywhere, then you just get sparse random random graphs. But I mean, this is a very general model. It's very flexible. And so you can ask, okay, does it satisfy these properties? Well, you can do some computations and you could get that uh, your, uh, your degree distribution uh, converges to some sort of mixed Poisson uh, distribution. And in particular, right, if this, uh, the random variable you get here, which is not exactly W, it also depends on this kappa. If it has a finite mean, then indeed your graphs are sparse and the average degree is just the expected value of this kappa, of this uh, W kappa. So they're sparse. And you can even pick your W depending on kappa, you can pick your W to be regularly varying. And then for a large range of kappas, you can also prove that the uh, till distribution function of your, uh, uh, of your degrees also converges to a regular varying function. So they also have power law degrees. The problem is that the problem comes with clustering. So a very sort of uh, back of the envelope computation yields that if you look at the expected number of triangles in your whole graph, it looks like this, right? So you need to look at uh, three uh, versions of this kappa, right? For all of the pairs uh, of uh, nodes in your triangle, you get an n to the minus three out there, right? Because that was for each of the probabilities. But then of course you have to look at all possible pairs of nodes or triples of nodes, that's n choose three. And so you can already see that if this, uh, this, this integral is finite, then basically this is something of order one. Meaning that as your graphs become bigger and bigger, right, the number of triangles just stays a constant order. Some integrability, I'm, I'm not being very explicit here, but there's some integrability function. Uh, this is the expectation, right? So kappa is, it has to be, it has to be, it has to be, uh, if kappa is not constant right, there has to be some, uh, there are some integrability uh, properties. Can you give me an example of one kappa? Yeah, a constant kappa will, uh, will work, but a constant kappa or a product of uh, the, the weights, for example, or um, even, uh, even if you take, uh, if you take, uh, say, uh, uh, the, the minimum to a certain power times the maximum, these types of things. So, but basically the, the, the gist here is, and you can make this uh, computation very explicit and also look at all of these other properties. The conclusion is that there's no clustering in these, uh, in these graphs. Basically, all of these graphs, that's also very nice, all of these graphs are basically sort of locally tree-like. They can be approximated by branching processes, not necessarily Galton-Watson processes, by branching processes. So there are no triangles. Can one argue that this way of modeling kappa is capturing something realistic in the real world? Uh, it's modeling through, through kappa. Uh, no, you can think of it, right? So you can, for example, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now sort of trying to pretend to be like a sociologist, right? So you can think of sort of the weight as representing in some way sort of the, uh, uh, sort of the, the, say, the type of person you are maybe or the type of hobbies that you have. And then you can say, well, if I have two people and if, for example, uh, uh, depending on their hobbies, right, they might have some, some, uh, some sort of strength or some, uh, 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 some sort of type of affiliation strength that will make them sort of become friends. And maybe my function kappa can capture how this depends on their, their hobbies or their interests, right? But again, right, I'm pretending to be sociologist. I'm not, right? No, but there are arguments why, why, why a model like this might, might be realistic. But the problem is you don't get clustering which I mean in social networks you do. 
Okay, so that's a problem. So then, com then comes in the first, for the first time that we see geometry here. So the second model I want to talk about is just random geometric graphs, right? So that's very standard. You take a number of nodes. You have a position space, usually d-dimensional Euclidean space. You can be more fancy if you want. And a connection radius r. What you do is you take a torus of volume n, you throw n points uniformly at random in the torus, and you connect to points if they are within distance r. That gives you a, that gives you a graph. You can already see where this is going. Uh, so indeed, because of the triangle inequality, right, if two nodes are connected, it means they're, they're close by. So if I have a node that has two other nodes connected to it, those are close to this node. And then by the triangle inequality, they're also reasonably close together. So there's a larger probability of them also being connected. So in particular, I mean, you can do the computations. These things have clustering. They're clustered, right? They're triangles. Um, they're also sparse. Uh, the average uh, the degree distribution basically converges again to a mixed Poisson. But now this is just uh, the volume of the d-dimensional ball of radius r. But that also immediately gives the problem because this thing, uh, you can never, you cannot tune this, this distribution. Uh, so you don't, th this is just always going to be a Poisson type of distribution. You don't get powerless. Position space, if you take r, d, or torus, doesn't matter. Uh, for the finite for the finite set, you take uh, you take uh, the the torus, and then for say for the infinite setting, you can take R D. You have to take a Poisson point process. I will actually come back to that also at a later stage. So basically, the summary is that okay, we have this nice general set of models that gives us sparse graphs that have power law degrees. We have a model with geometry that is sparse and clustered, but no power law degrees. There are many other models are out there, but usually you get get a flavor like this. And then the question is well. Can't we get the best of both worlds, right? Because we want to basically to have all of these three properties. And the answer to this is yes. And I mean, you might already see uh, what, what, uh, how to do this, uh, but this is uh, in a set of models that we, uh, together with uh, Niladri Maitra and, uh, and Remco, who are also sitting here, this is what we call spatial and homogeneous random graphs. Um, and basically the model goes as follows. So uh, we have, these set of parameters, there are n number of nodes. There's a position space. Again, r to the d could be fancier metric spaces. There's a positive weight random variable, and there's a connection function. What are we going to do? Well, take a torus of volume n, throw n points uniformly at random in them, like the random geometric graph. But now, like the inhomogeneous random graph, we're going to give each node an IID sampled weight from this, random, from this distribution. And then for any two pair of nodes, we're going to connect them with a probability that is now basically something like this. So it's a probability that depends via the function kappa on their distance in the torus and their weights. So we're just combining geometry and the, and the weight preferences. And again, right, again, there, there are conditions on kappa, right? I'm not going to be very explicit, but there are some, some sort of mild conditions on kappa that you need in terms of integrability or how sort of the, the how basically if you integrate out to the Ws, how this function depends on the first parameter, these types of things. Now, and the nice thing is that actually this family of models actually incorporates many known models that many models that were already known. They, for instance, include uh, hyperbolic random graphs. Uh, they include uh, what are called uh, geometric inhomogeneous random graphs, which are almost like this, but slightly less general. Uh, they also include a random connection model with weights, continuous uh, scale field percolation. All of these types of models can be captured in this family. And in particular, right, that also means that at least Within this family, there are models, there are choices to be made such that we get all three properties. But we can actually be more explicit about this. We can actually, actually, we can actually also actually prove sort of very broadly that uh, we get all of these three properties. And the reason we can do that is because these models have something that is even nicer than those three properties. They have local weak limits. Meaning that we can sort of, we have a notion of convergence of these graphs and we can explicitly describe their limits. Yeah, basically, you, you basically uh, you couple the hyperbolic graph uh, uh, to a one-dimensional uh, geometric and homogeneous random graph. So instead of looking at, uh, say, the, uh, the hyperbolic plane, right, uh, with, uh, with positions with, uh, that are sort of alpha uniformly <laughs> distributed, you, uh, you look at uh, sort of a, a circle uh, where you put points on the circle and then you give it weights. And there's, a, there's, sort of, there's a transformation between these two models, which is not exact, but it's exact up to a reasonable... Uh, up to some scale, and that works. Uh, this is basically how, it, how, how you see this here. For more details, you can look into the paper we have. Uh. How 
the let's start with this question again. Um, you have to put some assumption on the connection function, right? Make it too constant, you can get dense graph. Uh, yeah, so what I what I really need, right, in order to not get dense graphs, right, is uh, uh, it, that really basically depends on how it depends on their distance, right? So for for example, right, if I if basically this uh, this kappa is independent of the distance, of course, yeah, then then I get dense graphs. So indeed, there are some conditions on on kappa. They're they're actually quite quite lenient. We can actually get, uh, and I mean, I can include a slide with all of those things, right? But uh, there are some conditions, but they're quite lenient. Uh, but indeed, if you're not careful, then you get you get dense graphs or nonsense things. Uh. Okay. So I want to talk a bit about these uh, local weak limits, and for that I need to well, at least I thought I would have to at least talk a bit about local weak convergence. So here's my attempt of capturing local weak convergence in one slide. Uh, and then, uh, if at the end of the slide uh, Remco uh, doesn't walk away, then I think I have done a reasonable job, right? So, okay. So. The main question you can ask in general about any sequence of random graphs is, well, when does a sequence like this converge? And for dense, gra dense graphs or almost dense graphs, there are very beautiful theories and, and frameworks for this. But we're interested in sparse graphs, and those are usually quite difficult. And local weak convergence tries to sort of capture this, this concept. So when does this sequence converge? So here's the idea. You have a sequence of graphs, say gn, gn plus 1, right? They're slowly growing. And you want to understand, well, what does it mean for this sequence to grow to sort of some infinite graph? Now, it turns out if you want to do this, you shouldn't just look at the infinite graph, but you should look at an infinite graph together with a designated root that we call the uh, designated node we call the root. And then basically, what is the idea of local weak convergence? Well, if you take, if you take a, unif a node sampled uniformly at random in, say, this graph, and you look at its local neighborhood, and you do the same in this graph and in this graph, then basically local weak convergence says that. This is a limit of the sequence if the probability of observing a certain neighborhood around these uniformly randomly sampled points converges either in distribution or in probability to the probability of observing this neighborhood around the root. That is basically the idea behind local weak convergence. You can make this, for example, a bit more explicit by saying that, okay, what does it mean? You need that for every positive r and any finite rooted uh, graph, that the, the fraction of nodes whose r neighborhood in the graph is isomorphic in the rooted graph sense to this graph, that this fraction converges in probability to the probability that the R neighborhood of the root is isomorphic. This is one way of uh, doing it. There are lots of, there are also other ways to, uh, to characterize this. Uh, so you can also characterize this in the sense that uh, for every bounded continuous uh, function H, basically it's a value uh, for around for a given, uh, uh, for a uniformly sampled uh, node conditioned on the graph that that conditional expectation converges uh, to the same, but then for the, the infinite graph. The main takeaway from this is, and this is very important, that if you have local weak convergence, then you should be very happy, because what it means is that any property of your graph that is local, right, will have a limit. Every property of your graph that only depends on, say, a finite neighborhood will have a limit in the, the infinite graph, and often you can explicitly write down what that limit is. Of course, it still depends on the exact graph and model you pick, but you can do this. So it's a very powerful tool. And the nice thing is that for these spatially homogeneous random graphs, we actually have this local weak convergence. And maybe you can already guess what the limit is. I might even have sort of given it away already. Uh, so again, this is a reminder of the model, right? So n points uniform with random in a n volume d-dimensional torus, weights and connections according to this kappa. So then the result that uh, together with uh, Remco and Niladri we have is that under some mild conditions on this W and kappa, and they're actually quite mild, then you have local weak convergence of the sequence of random graphs. And where do they converge to? Well, they converge to a random graph that we can indeed see again as being now uh, positioned on just RD. And the root graph, uh, the root node is just the origin in RD. And the graph is constructed well, as you might expect. Well, what you do is instead of having endpoints uniformly at random, here, you just take a Poulton version of a unit rate plus on point process where you have conditions on the root or the origin being in the point process. And then, again, every point gets an IID copy of W, and you just connect it again with kappa that the, the same kappa that depends on uh, the distance, now in, uh, now in RD, not in the torus, and the weights. We have a more general result where also this kappa here can depend on n, and then there's an additional type of condition about how fast this kappa, what kind of convergence kappa n needs to have to kappa, but I didn't want to include it here. 
But basically, it is what you would expect. So you generated the graph on a torus of volume n, you basically stretch out the torus to infinity, you get Rd, and then you just put the, the right plus one point process for the nodes, you get the limit. Might be easy to see. Proving it is a, is a different thing, right? So you really need some, some clever, clever things to actually get this proof to work. And, uh, where the dependence? Uh, uh, all of these W's are independent. And the X's are also, they are uniform, right? So they're also independent, yeah. Now, another nice thing, actually, that, that we also were able to prove for these uh, versions of the models, which doesn't follow immediately from local reconversions, is that also, uh, if you look at uh, the, the degree of a uniformly sampled node in your graph, then as a sequence of random variables, this is a uniformly integrable sequence. And that will actually help us. It will be very helpful. Um, so then, oh, yeah. Uh, well, G infinity is, of course, an infinite graph, so you would have to come up with some way to assemble, uh, say, a finite set of vertices from that. Um, so the first question is, do you have a way or not? Okay. Well, yes, yes, well, yes. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, this is a very dangerous question, because if, I don't, if I'm not careful, then I will, I will give a whole another lecture uh, on, 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 on a way to basically... But there's a way you can sort of look at this infinite graph in, in a certain way, such that you can, uh, you can sort of extract finite size models from the infinite graph, meaning that if I would give you the infinite graph, then I'm also giving you a way to sample finite size models. The second part of the question would be these finite um, size no, versions of this graph. Yeah. Are, are they the same as the GN? Do we have like sampling consistency or do we get in, in, in the setting that I'm thinking of, which, which is slightly, slightly different from here, but very closely related, right? And we can talk to it offline. Most likely, yes. This is a project that I'm actually working on, so I would be very happy to discuss this afterwards. Uh, because if I would start now, then I will continue till the end of today. But uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you for the question. Yeah. I guess one of the difficulties is that we're working on torus. Yeah. So the boundary of the torus moves. It's difficult. You know, this is the consistent boundary of regions. Torus is zero boundary. No, yeah, well, yes, if you would do with zero bound with no boundary condition, then it would be easy to think about. But if you then if you then move this away from local reconvergence and talk and, 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 and think about another way, another version of convergence, uh, then uh, you might be able to still deal with uh, boundary conditions on the torus. But uh, we can talk offline on this. Uh, yeah. OK, so very, very, very quickly. Uh, so what can we now prove? Well, we can indeed prove that these graphs are sparse. Um, and actually, for this, we need this trick. We need to use this uh, uniform integrability because the degrees are definitely local, but they're not necessarily bounded. So it's not a bounded property. But you can always sort of split it, of course, in, uh, by picking some fixed k. You can split it in something that is bounded right, by what you put. Then this converges by local reconvergence. And then this converges to 0 in the end when taking k to infinity because of uniform integrability. And then this then converges to the average degree. In total, this converges to the average degree of the root. You can prove this. But this is where you basically need uniform integrability. Now, for power law degrees, you can also have, be very specific. So we can be very explicit about what the degree of the, the root is. Uh, so it's some uh, mixed boson with some mixture that depends on kappa and, uh, and uh, the weight. Just, just rotation so SIRG is one which your vertices, n vertices, uh, a weight function, and a connection function. Yes, and yeah, and these positions, right? Yeah. So you can, you can, uh, you can, you, we know what the distribution of the degree of the root is, and then we can indeed also prove that indeed the the till distribution uh, in the in my in my finite size random graphs converges to the till distribution of this root. And again, depending on uh, there are there are ways that you can pick your kappa and your w uh, to get regular varying functions here. Now, finally, for clustering, again, clustering. This is this is this is a bounded and local property, so local reconverge immediately gives you that this basically converges to the clustering coefficient of the root. Similarly, you can prove that this local clustering function converges to this expression, which is just, it's the, the clustering coefficient of the root conditioned on the root having the weak k. So it's, but again, right, this is, this is very nice. Local reconvergence basically gives you all of this. 
And then because, of the, because these models uh, have this geometry, you can also prove that these things are indeed uh, strictly positive, all of them. All right. So what I want to talk to, one, uh, one, uh, one last thing before I move on to the next, what I want to do is I want to talk a bit more about, uh, basically about this last part, right? Because remember that one of the things, as I said, is ideally what we want is that this function is regularly varying as well. So I now know that the, the, the clustering function of my random graphs converges to some limit function. And now I can ask, well, when is this limit function regularly varying? So this is what we started in a different paper where we used sort of a slightly more specified model setting. So it's still in this family. We took our weights to be Pareto uh, uh, with a, a PDF exponent beta, strictly bigger than two. And our kappa is of this form. So the most important part is that we do is we take the, uh, the maximum of the two weights and we multiply it by the minimum, which we raise to some power A. And then we divide it by the, the distance to the power D. We, of course, have to take the, the maximum uh, of this and one because else it's not a probability. And we can also take this to a power alpha. Where alpha can be inf infinite, meaning that at, when we take alpha infinite, it's just the indicator that this thing is, uh, is strictly bigger than one. This is how you interpret alpha to infinity, if alpha is infinity. But the main thing is that uh, we pick this, this, this product of the minimum uh, weights and the maximum weights. Now, and what we can then show is uh, that indeed, this, uh, we, can, we can basically uh, establish the scaling of this, limit, uh, of this limit function very explicitly. Uh, so in particular, we get that if we rescale this function by some function, uh, that we have explicitly, it converges to some constant. And of course, everything depends on all the parameters that we have. And now it's of course very important what this function is, right? Because if we, well, we would like it to be regularly varying and it turns out it is. So here is, uh, it, it has five different cases depending on the couple of parameters. Should we look at this, look at this picture. So this is a picture that uh, Niladi uh, generated. So basically what you see, there's this red regime or had this red regime. And in this red regime, basically, this function scales as k to the minus 1. At the boundary, this, this dark red boundary, you get an additional log correction factor. Then as you move into the, and when you move into the yellow regime, basically, the scaling is still an inverse power of k, but now the exponent actually depends on your model parameters. And then at the green boundary, this, you, you're only left with a, a logarithmic scaling. And then in the blue boundary, actually, this function is constant, meaning that this function is also constant, doesn't depend on k. And that's actually interesting um, because here, above this orange line here, your graphs are still sparse. So here we have sparse graphs, but the clustering coefficient, this clustering function is constant as k goes to infinity. So that means that no, no matter how large you pick your, your k, right? Your, your, your node is going to be sparse, but it will have many triangles. So even very large nodes, right, will have many triangles, but your graph is still sparse. So it's a very structured graph. Here, here we have very structured graphs. Below this line, the, the degrees are infinite or undefined. So, but this is very nice. Uh, so basically, we, we can prove that for basically in this broad uh, subfamily, we get uh, a clustering function that is regularly varying. We can actually completely characterize the scalings in the different regimes. And if you're interested, we also have explicit uh, expressions for this gamma, explicit meaning in terms of integrals of some functional that depends on your model choices. Uh, well, at some point, you also have to integrate out uh, over, the, over the positions. And then D plays a role in the sense that uh, 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 you, get, uh, you get, say, uh, in, inside this constant, you get uh, volumes of, uh, of the D-dimensional unit ball. So this is how D comes up. And it also comes up in that some of the integrals are uh, over D-dimensional space. Uh, yeah. So when from this clustering function, you want to go back to the average local clustering, you only did that at the beginning to say that you need to find the uh, rather than the Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, is that you have to concurrently also compute the expected degree distribution and integrate Uh, well, you can, but you can also directly compute the clustering coefficient. Yeah, yeah, again, right? You have this, uh, if I go back, you have this very explicit expression. You can, you can just compute this. In terms of the phase diagram with all the colors, uh, does it mean that there is some region where the clustering is finite and where you get this from? The average color clustering. 
The average local, oh, that's a good question. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, de it's definitely finite up to here. Uh, and then at the boundary, I don't know. And here, I'm also don't know. I don't think we looked at this. I'm now looking also. Well, if that is constant, yeah. I guess you remain constant. Yeah. Yeah, so expect it to also be, be, uh, be constant here. Exactly. Yeah. So but but uh, this, this is, I don't know for sure. Okay. Let's see. Anywhere here to have a finite local clustering. Yes, a local cluster coefficient here should be finite and probably also here, but we, we haven't looked at this exactly. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Well, it does not. But the why is. It turns out the dimension only comes in uh, uh, in the constant. Yeah. Yeah. So the D is not here, right? And then, so there, there might be there might be different uh, kappas that you can pick such that your dimension will play a role. But for this 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 family say of kappas, it uh, it does not. And indeed, they're they're sort of picked cleverly. So that also, for example, if you if you look at if you just integrate this out over the over the w's basically uh, you just if you integrate this out right everything then basically what you get because of this choice you just get uh, you just get uh, sort of unit volume balls can sort of extract them because of this this form that's why you always get the volume factor for the two so yes you always get the volume factor somewhere out and then uh, and then the rest uh, yeah so okay so it's a clever yeah. So in retrospect, it's a clever way of we, of, of of us picking it. Um, but it's I mean, if you just look at this, it's not completely obvious that it doesn't depend on them. D. Okay. No. Uh, so I want to do one thing is that, uh, and basically, so what I did now is uh, um, so let okay. So let me now move to uh, another set of models within this family of models. Which are uh, one dimensional, it, they're, they're called one dimensional uh, geometric and homogeneous random graphs. So basically, in this set of models, right, I just pick D to be one, A to be one, right? So I just take the product of the weights uh, and I take alpha to be infinity. It just means that, and I add an additional constant here that's not that important. So I get, basically, I have this, pro this connection probability function. So just, you just look at if your distance less than this, uh, this product of the weights with this constant. If so, you put an edge. Uh, and again, your uh, your Ws are power laws. Now, to show you the results, I'm going to do a slight uh, change of uh, notation. I'm going to write uh, beta as two eta. Doesn't really change anything. So basically, this is now the, the setting. It will give us slightly better expressions. Um, so what do I want to say? Well, first of all, what do we know, right? We know for these models. Th these models fall under spatial homogeneous random graphs. So we know that by local reconvergence, this property for every k converges to this. We also know for this function that this function, we know what this asymptotic scaling is. But we don't, what we don't know from this is what is the asymptotic scaling of this thing. Because we only have pointwise convergence here, and here we have an asymptotic result. So together, they don't necessarily imply that this thing also has this scale. Local reconversion doesn't give you this. But this is a relevant question to ask. And it turns out, so let me first indeed just slightly simplify this, uh, this expression using that a, a is one, uh, these types of things, I get basically this. So basically what we would like to show is that this thing also scales basically asymptotically as that. And that's not an immediately consequence of the, of the local reconvergence result. <coughs> However, for these models, we were able to prove that. And with we, uh, I mean... This is to work together with Nicolaus von Tulaak and Stobius Muller, also in the audience, and uh, PhD student of him at that time, Marcus Schepers. So basically, what do we prove here? So here we have the local clustering function for the graph. We divide this by what its limit should be. And importantly, we consider a sequence of, uh, of case that also grows to infinity as n goes to infinity. And what we can then prove is that this fraction converges to one in probability. 
So what that means, that means that indeed the scaling of this thing is the, asymptotically has the same scaling as this thing. That's something that we didn't get from local reconversions, but at least for these, for these models, we can prove it explicitly. Now, there's one condition, uh, K can't, this, these sequences can't grow too fast, but with too fast, I mean that if they would grow strictly faster than this, than this rate, then a result like this can never be proven. So we're basically almost at the optimal range of what we can have our K grow, how fast K can grow. Okay, so to summarize this part before I very briefly go over the second part, but that's okay, yeah. Now, I mean, if you take, I mean, you can also take KN to stop growing at some point, but then uh, the result already follows from local uh, reconversion because if K is fixed. Here we want K to constantly grow. We basically want to constantly sort of look, look further and further and further as our graphs grow and then show that this scaling is what we would expect it to be. K can always be fixing the exact result that we have in the paper, then basically uh, uh, K just has to be, K is basically little of this and it can be fixed. It can stop at some point growing. Okay, so to summarize uh, this part, basically what I, I mentioned is that, uh, what I try to explain is that we want, to, we want random graph models that mimic these properties of sparse power law degrees and clustering, and that by adding geometry, that actually helps us, and actually by you actually utilizing geometry, you can actually get models that have all of this. And actually the models that we have also have local reconversions, which make them very powerful, because you actually very easily get asymptotic expressions, and then you just have to analyze the asymptotic expressions. Now, the title of this conference also is challenges in, uh, in networks. So I also have some challenges, right? There's always some challenges left. Um, so one is of course to also utilize, now we utilize the geometry to study clustering and degrees, but of course it would also be interesting utilizing this geometry to study other structural features of graphs that is uh, often still open. Um, then, Ideally, ideally, we would also like to be able, as I mentioned in the slide below, right? So if you want to also have this, this scaling at a finite size level, right? Then that doesn't immediately follow from local reconvergence. So it would be very nice if we can extend sort of uh, this local reconvergence to also basically give us these type of uh, finite size scalings as well. And finally, it would also be nice to develop a framework that doesn't only give us asymptotics for lo fixed local properties, but for what I would call almost local properties. So there's a very nice result by Remco where he proves that if you look at the size of the giant component uh, for graphs that have, uh, say, a local weak limit, then if you add, add one more condition on these models, and it's an if and only if condition, then you can prove that the fraction of nodes in the giant converge, converge to the probability that the root is in the infinite component. So it's basically saying that sort of yeah, the size of this, this, this giant component is sort of an almost local property. It's still reasonably captured well by this local reconvergence concept. And it would be nice to extend this to other properties as well, such as, for example, K-cores or these types of things. All right, I have five minutes. Perfect. So I will skip through several slides here. I will try to give you the punchline here because I think this is also very nice. So I just spent a lot of time basically talking about how to use geometry to get nice models for random graphs. And now I want to go the other way around. You use geometry to get, a, to get a network. You only give me the network and you ask to me, ah, can, you say, can you tell me something about the geometry I used? So, and ideally, what do I want to be able to tell you? Well, I would like to tell you, for example, what is the curvature of your geometric space? And for those of you that are not a sort of a geometrist, for example, you can think of curvature as just a very, very simple general notion to indicate how different your space is from Euclidean space. So if your space has zero curvature, it's, it's Euclidean, then you have spaces of negative curvature, hyperbolic type of spaces, and the other regime is space of positive curvature, spherical spaces. Now, they're different if you uh, work in the field of Riemannian manifolds, there are different ways to characterize geometry. In this part, I'm going to focus on Ricci curvature. And this I do want to cover. I'm not going to give you the definition of Ricci curvature, it's in terms of, uh, of, uh, hey, of, uh, of, uh, of a uh, of a tensor on the manifold, all of these types of things that I don't want to do. What I want to give you is sort of an idea of what Ricci curvature tells you about moving balls. So what I mean with this, so I'm taking a point on my manifold, a vector in some direction, and then basically if I compute the Ricci curvature of this Ricci curvature constant of, the, of this vector, that is basically related to how much my volume, volumes of ball change 
when I move them along the direction of V. So what do I mean with this? If I, if I walk a certain direction, if I walk a certain distance delta in the direction of V and I enter the point Y, I then take a ball around X and now I'm going to transport this ball parallel to, uh, with respect to the vector V towards Y. So I'm going to do parallel transport of this ball and then several things can happen. First, if this Ricci curvature is zero, the volume of this ball is preserved. So the volume of the ball end up is the same. If Ricci curvature is negative, my volume will increase. So in hyperbolic spaces, volumes increase. And if my Ricci curve is positive, volumes shrink. And this is important because it tells us that without giving you a definition of Ricci curvature, it tells you that if you want to move away, right? Because if you want to say something about the curvature of your geometric space based only on your graph, you need some notion of curvature for your graph. And basically this intuition tells you that, okay, what would you need to do this? Well, you would need three things. You would need a notion of a distance. Well, okay, so it's a metric space, shortest paths, for example, right? You need some way to measure the volume of a ball. In this, here we're going to do this by using probability measures on our, on our graph, uh, on our nodes. And finally, you need to be able to compare ball volumes. And here we're going to do that using optimal transport distance. This is very abstract, but let me give you the definition of, uh, of, uh, of curvature that you can use on the graph. This was coined, uh, this, was come, uh, this was done by, Olivier, uh, by Jan Olivier in around 2006. It, uh, there's a nice paper from 2009. And it's a very general, it's for any metric space. So you have a metric space, and then at every point in your metric space, you have a probability measure on, uh, have a probability measure. And then you define the curvature between two points as this, is, uh, this expression where W1 is simply the Wasserstein metric of order one of these probability measures. Now, why does that make sense, right? Let me, uh, let's consider two points. So I'm going to take a uniform measure on, on point X, I'm taking a uniform measure on a ball of radius epsilon. And at point Y, I'm taking a uniform random measure on a ball of radius epsilon prime. Now, if epsilon and epsilon prime are the same, then you can show that this Wasserstein distance is just exactly the distance, so that means that this curvature is zero. So if the balls have the same volume, curvature is zero. If this ball, if this ball is larger, you can show that this curvature is negative. If the ball is smaller, the curvature is positive. So you evaluate the equation and how it moves back? Hmm? You, you say you move No, no, so I, I do parallel transport, right? So, well, here I don't, right? So here I just compare uh, two uh, uniform measures on balls of different sizes. But in the, in the manifold setting, I do a parallel transport. So every point, right, in my ball is transported parallel with respect to the, the, to the vector that I took. And then depending on the metric, it can sort of deviate away from that trajectory, which means that I'm stretching out my ball or I'm compressing my ball. Yes, it's, you can't put too much on the Yeah, because you do parallel transport again. So if you ping pong right, you will uh, things will explode. If you ping pong, things will explode. But then, this is just uh, this is just a, a sort of an intuition to think about this Ricci curve, to right? So I mean, but this parallel transport is uh, 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 this is uh, this is a property of the geometry of the space. So basically stretching out space and compressing space. But indeed. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, no, this is the notation I took from, uh, sorry, yeah, indeed, sorry, this is notation I took from, from, all of, from all of your paper, yeah. Yeah, no, it has nothing to do with my previous. Now, I will take two, uh, two more minutes. Um, this is a nice intuition. It at, at least tells you in some way that sort of this, this uh, larger, smaller balls, it somehow, uh, it somehow compares. But the, the best result is the following. So you can take a smooth, you can just see what happens if you apply this notion to the Riemannian manifold setting. So you take a smooth, complete, n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, take two points at distance delta, take, take the uniform measure of a ball of radius epsilon on both points, and now, Olivier proved, basically, he gave an exact expression, asymptotic expression for his curvature in terms of the Ricci curvature and the parameters delta and epsilon. 
And in particular, from this, it follows that if you rescale this Olivier Ricci curvature by a constant that depends on the dimension and the distance, and then you let both the distance decrease and you shrink the balls, then you recover the Ricci curvature. That makes sense. Curvature is a local property, so you need to look at smaller and smaller regions. But it also shows that at least in the continuous setting, this notion of curvature makes sense in a way that you can actually recover Ricci curvature from it. Now, I will just briefly skip over this. So the question then immediately comes, okay, if you can do it in the, um, if you can do it in the continuous setting, then can you do the same in the discrete setting? So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to look at two points in our graph that are at a certain distance away from each other. We're going to put a metric space on the graph by putting weights on all the edges. So we're looking at our graph as an edge-weighted graph. And then the metric is just going to be the shortest weighted path distance. And then, for, uh, and then we also need to uh, say what the probability measures around each point are. So for that, we're going to take some, uh, some delta n. And at every point, we're going to look at the uniform measure on, on basically all nodes within distance delta n from the node. So you take a node to your graph. Look at all other nodes whose shortest weight of path distance is less than delta, and you take just a uniform measure on those nodes. It's very similar to the setup for the, uh, for the continuous setting. And we, of course, have to study this in a certain model, right? We want to prove that we can recover curvature. So what we do is we basically do uh, random geometric graphs on a Riemannian manifold, compact. So you take a compact Riemannian manifold, you first have to put your, your, your reference node x here with a vector v. You put another node here at distance delta. And then you just put a uniform, uh, you put a point process on the manifold such that the expected number of points is n. And you just connect all points that are within, uh, within the radius epsilon. So I first have to put two points there because that's where I want to compute curvature over. And then I just put a random geometric graph around it. Now the question is, right, if you give me this graph, can I recover the curvature of the manifold you use to construct it? Very shortly, the answer is yes. Depending on, you need some scaling, you need some scaling of the connection radius and the measure radius, but you can recover it. You can actually recover it in an L1 convergence. So quite strongly. Now, what I do want to say is that we can only prove this for non-sparse settings. We can make it almost sparse, meaning that we can tune the parameter such that the average degree scales only logarithmically, we can't do it for sparse graphs. Um, what I want to show before I end is I want to show you that actually we prove convergence, but our theoretical results can't really give you a reasonable rate of convergence. We can only get logarithmic rates, but this is a plot of simulations, large-scale simulations, that actually show you that this rate of convergence is actually quite fast. So here's the size of our graph. And here's for different, different types of manifolds. So we have a torus for uh, curvature 0, a sphere for curvature 1, and a Bolsa surface for curvature minus 1. Bolsa surface is a compact hyperbolic uh, manifold. And you can see that all of these, all of these region curvatures converge quite fast already for around, if your graph is 10 to the 4.5. Actually, your Ricci curvature is already quite close to the actual curvature of the manifold. So these results are quite, uh, quite good. What is more surprising is that when we do the simulations for sparse graphs, meaning outside of the regime that we can actually prove, we also get convergence. So we can't prove that this holds for sparse graphs, but the simulation strongly suggests that it should be true. And, that's, and actually, this brings us uh, to one of the main challenges here is indeed that I had so very briefly, because I was a bit out of time, which was OK. We had some nice discussions. Is what I want to basically, what the, the summary here is that there is a notion of curvature that you can define on your graph such that you can recover the curvature of the manifold you used to construct your graph. So you can extract geometric properties from your discrete structure in some asymptotic sense. We can only prove this for non-sparse graphs, but simulation seems to suggest that it holds for, uh, for sparse graphs as well. So one of the main challenges here is to actually prove this for sparse graphs. But for this, we really need new ideas. All of our ideas and our, our, the, the techniques that we use are completely useless in the sparse case. 
And in the end, of course, the general challenge in this sort of topical field, I would say, is that, well, geometry is a very powerful component in both, uh, the, uh, in both creating random graphs, but also in studying their properties. But in general, we have sort of very little idea of what the actual impact is of adding geometry or models on the actual structure. I mean, yes, we can expect that clustering is increased, and we do see this. But we really don't know what happens if, uh, if you, how, what the impact of geometry is on other structural properties of our graph at a general level. So this is what I would say is a general challenge in, this type of, uh, in these types of models. So with that, I come to the most important slide, which is where I thank all my, uh, all all my co-authors that helped uh, on all of these projects. So these are William Cunningham, Nicolaas von Tlakes, Remco from the Hofstadt, Dimitri Hukov, Gabor Lipner, Niladik Maita, Tobias Muller, Marcus Schepers, and Carlos Stukenberger. This is a list of uh, the papers uh, that cover all of the things that I talked to today. So if you're interested in any of them, you can look them up here. And with that, being slightly over time, I do want to thank you for your patience, your attention, and I will be happy to take any short questions. We have time for a few questions. Uh, if I remember correctly, after uh, there was some work uh, characterizing Olivier Ricci curvature. Uh, in graph in terms of uh, an expansion over uh, loops of different sizes. So it was a combinatorial alternative uh, uh, characterization of it. You didn't touch upon this. Uh, yeah. But uh, perhaps there's a way to study directly this expansion and all the terms to, to control the asymptotics. So does this... Yeah, so I mean, I, I know that I, that result I, I have indeed seen. I. I have to refresh, it was a paper, I don't remember. Yeah, there might be something there. I mean, I have to, I, I, it's still on my list of things to look into more carefully, uh, but there could, there could be something there. So you're right, there could be something there uh, to, actually, to actually study the asymptotics more, more carefully. But I don't dare to say exactly how, whether or not you can actually do it with these techniques uh, and, and how much work it might be. Edge weights, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are two ways you can choose this. This is I skipped over this before uh, for time, but they're basically for our results. We have two versions of the results. One is the cheating result, and in the cheating result, what we do is, for every edge, we put as a weight the distance between the nodes on the manifold. So that's cheating. You're putting, you're exactly you're putting geometric information in your graph. Okay, you can recover the curvature. Yay! Congratulations, right? But we also have a result for the non-cheating case, uh, where basically the weights that we put is just the connection radius. And the idea behind this is that if your graphs are, uh, are, uh, are, not, uh, are, are reasonably dense, then if you look at nodes that are, are a bit further apart, then the actual distance in the manifold is very well approximated by just uh, epsilon times the shortest path distance. So this is a result that was proven for two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, a two-dimensional Euclidean uh, space. Uh, and we can then use this for our setting where we just look at two-dimensional manifolds because we're only interested in local properties. So we just look sort of uh, very locally, then approximated by uh, a Riemannian manifold, and then use this result that says that epsilon times the shortest path distance is a good approximation of the manifold distance. Yeah, but thanks for that question. So yes, that's, uh, I skipped over it.
Hi, Piyush. This is Rajat. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Okay, so yeah, uh, I, I think your volume needs a bit of increase or? Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Spius, can you say something so that we can? Uh, yeah, is is it better now? Yeah, it's better. Okay. okay. And uh, do you want to start sharing the slide? Uh, it's already shared. Uh, ah, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, he has pinned it. Okay. So, okay. Let Let me see. So, yeah. Yeah, this sounds better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we are ready. So we'll we'll begin in. Uh, so people are taking coffee, and uh, okay, once okay. they come back. Uh, we'll start. Okay, welcome everyone. And as people start getting in uh, with their coffee, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Piyush Srivastava. So he's from uh, uh, TIFR Bombay. He's in the computer science uh, unit there. And uh, so just a few words about Piyush. Piyush uh, uh, the, did his PhD from uh, Berkeley and then was in Caltech for some time and then returned India 
and now he's an associate professor in the computer science department of uh, TIFR. His main interests are in probabilistic applications in computer science problems. Uh, he has worked on uh, various topics, so and various interesting topics. Uh, he has been a uh, speaker in many of our probability meetings. He was an LPS speaker two years back. And uh, today he will speak on some problems regarding Bayesian networks. Uh, Piyush, uh, hope you can hear it. So Piyush uh, could not come because of a teaching schedule. So we arranged an online talk for him. Okay, Piyush, over to you. Thank you again for the invitation and uh, apologies again for not being able to come to Bengal. Uh, so, so this talk uh, will be about uh, Bayesian networks and some problems about Bayesian networks. I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, uh, so this is going to be a survey talk. We talk uh, hoping to serve as an invitation to the commenters of Bayesian networks and there will be no proofs, which is uh, maybe both a good thing and a bad thing. And uh, actually, most of the talk is not going to be based on my work. Uh, it's going to be based on a work of a student here, Vijay Sagar. I'll mention some of uh, you know, what I did later, but uh, it's mostly it will be based on his work and discussions that I've had with him. So, so this will be this talk will be somewhat journalistic uh, and will be somewhat light. So, we'll be more focused on listing out problems and uh, what is open and what has recently been done. Okay, so uh, so let me just start with the definition of what a Bayesian network is. Uh, I'm sure uh, everyone is aware of it. But uh, so so very formally, it's a directed acyclic graph. The nodes are random variables, and the information in some sense is contained in the absent edges. And these absent edges, and so the graph could be complete, all edges could be present, but in every absent edge represents some kind of a conditional independence assumption. So here I've just written down an example. I write down the formal definition right below. So I have this graph, three variables, x, y, and z. So here is x, here is y, here is z. And uh, so this is x, y, and z. And um, and the x, y, edge is missing. And that encodes some kind of a conditional independence assumption, which is written down in the equation below, which is so that this probability. So if I just factorize the probability distribution, I can replace the probability of y given x as probability of y. That assumption is encoded in the edge being absent. So let's look at a slightly different. Uh, version. So, so if I change the arrows a little bit from x to y to y to z, now, now the assumption that the change becomes here. So z given x, y changes to z given y. So now the information is contained in this x to z edge being absent. Okay. So, so, so that's, so that's what a, the network is. And so the defining property is the smart core property. So if you take the, if you take the variables, and uh, you take the direct, the directed acyclic graph. This defines the partial the order on the vertices. So the topological sort of just the ordering consistent with the partial order imposed by the DAC. Then every xi is independent of not just xi minus one, like all the pre predecessors, but also all its non ancestors. So it's independent of all non ancestors. Condition on its pairs. So that's the def that's what that's the constraint that a Bayesian network inputs. Okay, so it can be seen as a procedural. Uh, so it's, it's generalization of Markov chain in some sense. You can go in the if you can take any topological sort, and you can keep sampling the variables one by one in that order because uh, so each variable the conditional probability it depends only upon its parents, which have already been sampled, and then you just compute the probability sample that variable and proceed. So that's one way of thinking about it, um, and uh, that's that's a definition. So here, uh, just to say this, the vertices are supposed to, when you, you this be used for modeling things, the so vertices are supposed to be subsystems of your system and edges are supposed to be the causal, causal relationships. That, that's what I was talking about right now, that the edges sort of depend. So you can think of them as basically saying what information does a variable need to sample itself, which other variables must have been sampled for. So, uh, so any, any questions about the definition uh, or this or, or, or the notation? Okay, so let's let me continue. So, uh, so, so the motivation for this actually came from causal inference that I would not that I will not be talking about much. But let me just uh, give this example because it has to be there in every talk about these. So, uh, so this is the old pro problem of trying to deduce whether something causally affects some other thing or not. Uh, and of course, whenever you see some correlation, it could just be because of some confounding factor. So here is one example that there could be a genetic factor that actually influences both a person's tendency to smoke and their uh, relation to get lung disease. 
uh, and actually this has been argued in hallowed uh, places like courts that uh, I just let you read. So it says that there might be the same thing that causes people to smoke that might predispose them to a disease. Uh, and uh, usually the way the golden um, method to solve this problem would be to do a, a control experiment to somehow remove the confounding edge. So this would be done by actually I mean, in this case, uh, in a very unrealistic thing of making half the population maybe smoke, the other half not smoke, and see what happens and why. Uh, so the notion of Bayesian network sort of arose in trying to get rid of this. So of course, this experiment cannot be done for ethical reasons and practical reasons. So the question was, when can you get uh, when can you get the same information uh, without doing the experiment? Um, in this case, you cannot. Uh, there are other slightly different models where you can. So Bayesian networks was a formalism to understand when you can and when you cannot. Uh, this part of the story, I will not go into much, but that's the motivation. So this part will be based on just no confounders. Everything will be seen. Everything will be visible. So all nodes will be visible. OK, so, so let's start with, the, <laughs> with an exercise. So, so I've written down four models here, uh, four graphical models. And uh, I want to uh, write down the conditional independence constraints that are implied by these models. Okay, so, so what's the conditional independence constraint implied by the first one, the very first one, the one on the left, this one here. So it's a Markov chain. The only constraint is that x is independent of z given y. So that's my notation for x being x independent of z given y. So, so given y, x and z become independent. And this is true in the third one also, which is just the same Markov chain in reverse. Okay, so this is uh, these two. Uh, what about the second one? I probably I can't hear. So, but yeah, so assuming everyone knows the answer. So, so second, the second one also actually has the same condition independence. So it only implies this one that x is independent of z given y. The interesting one is the fourth one. So here y has a collider or a v structure. So it is it is a it has it's a child of two nodes x and z, and the x and z are not adjacent to each other. And now the only conditional independence constraint here is x independent of z. And if you condition on y, actually they, they might become dependent. So somehow these first three models imply the same conditional cons independence constraint. And the third one, the last one, fourth one, is different. Uh, so is that clear that uh, in the third, the last one, um, you know, conditioning on y can make x and z dependent? The simplest example is just think of two uniformly random bits. So x and z are just uniformly random bits. And y is a is the XOR of them. So if you tell me the value of y, x, z, x becomes a function. So, so that's so it, so conditioning can completely destroy the name. Whereas in the other ones, conditioning is the thing that is needed for them. Otherwise, they might not be. So this is uh, so this is generalized to this notion of Markov equivalence. So two graphs are said to be Markov equivalent if they entail the same set of condition independence constraints. So in this picture here, these three are Markov equivalent. Okay. And this one is in a class of its own. Okay. So there are two equivalence classes. And uh, uh, so, in the, so two equivalence classes of what? So if, if I have only these two edges, one from x to y, one from y to z, then I can arrange them in possibly four different ways. And this is the easiest four ways here. But the number of equivalence classes is just two. Okay. Uh, and uh, so these are nice commutatorial criteria for doing this. Uh, so in particular, the deseparation method of Perl, which gives a very elegant commutatorial characterization of what the entailments are. So given a graph, I can tell you all, I mean, in principle, I can tell all the entailments. Uh, what it does in fact is to, given any entail, candidate entailment and the graph, the deseparation method lets you check whether that entailment holds. So it's actually, and it's actually based just on understanding these four examples. So these four examples are sufficient to handle the general case also more. Uh, any questions? Okay, so, uh, so, so yeah, so, so as I said, Markov equivalence uh, is, uh, so Markov equivalence classes are um, classes of Bayesian networks that are, that entail the same sort of condition independence constraints. Uh, and so why is this important? I mean, this is a nice commutatorial calculation, but why would it be important? So be, so here is the setup. So uh, here's a motivation from statistics. So if I'm trying to learn the model, if I only have data about the variables, if I have, let's say, the full probability distribution table of these variables x, y, and z on the last slide, then I all I can do is check condition independence constraints. 
So if I only have observational data, I can only check condition independence constraints. And because every model in those three class, you know, equivalence class gives rise to the same set of condition independence constraints, there is no way I can distinguish them using only observational data. So using only observational data, I cannot distinguish, for example, the Markov chain that is uh, that is uh, forward in time versus the one that is backward in time. So the x, y, z versus the z, y, x chain, I cannot distinguish. I also cannot distinguish that from the, the middle model, which is not a Markov chain at all. So to distinguish between the three, I will need to do something. Just observational data, just the probability table of x, y, and z will not be enough. Whereas to distinguish between the three on the left and the last one, the probability distribution table may be in. It's not necessarily enough. The uniform distribution, for example, satisfy all four of them, but it may be enough. So the issue is that uh, if if you have only observation data, there's nothing better than the Markov group class. You will, you will not be able to go finer than the Markov group class. So so that's uh, so that's uh, that leads to this kind of a uh, of a paradigm or the view that the size of the Markov group class. In some sense, is a measure of model uncertainty. So, given only observational data, how much uncertainty still remains uh, in the model uh, can be that itself can be modeled as a size of the Markov group. So, is this um, is this uh, okay? Uh, is this uh, like any objections to this or any questions? Any objections? Yes. <laughs> That is one. <laughs> there is one. Yeah. Just a moment, please. Yeah. Not an objection for the example that you showed in the previous slide. Yes. Uh, uh, these are the only three uh, possible uh, candidates for Markov equivalence in the left hand. Yeah. So, so in this case, uh, in in these four graphs that I showed, these are the only two classes. Okay. So one class is the three models on the left and the other class. Any further questions? No, you should go ahead. Okay, so 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 now I'll so since there are no options, so now I'll go to the problem of computing sizes. So and before that, let's uh, also look at a little bit about how to did how to represent Markov equivalence classes. So right now I was writing them as sets of graphs, which is what they are, but there should be some in description. So one way to do this might be something like this: that you take the you try to represent the Markov equivalence class as a partially directed graph, where an edge is directed if and only if it has the same direction in every member of the class. So remember, so let me just draw the previous uh, class. So this it looked like this. Okay, so there are three vertices in these in this model. And uh, and uh, and there are uh, two edges. So let me just draw them and let me see which of them I can direct in the MEC. So let's look at the first edge, this one here, this one. So this one has is directed upwards in one of them and downwards in one of them. So it does not have the same direction in every member. So I cannot direct it. So it remains undirected. The second one also for the same reason I cannot direct. So in this case, the Markov plus class is represented just by this undirected graph. Okay. So this this is their class. Similarly. Uh, the other, the remaining one, which was this one. So this is here. So this one, well, there's only one thing. So this is represented by itself. So this is a possible way of representing an NDC, where I draw just one graph on the same set of nodes, and I direct an edge if and only if it's directed in the same way everywhere. Okay. So, uh, so, so, okay. So, so, so. So not every such partially directed graph would be an MEC. Um, and uh, essential graphs are those partially directed graphs that can represent MECs. And the uh, I didn't write in the, on the slide, but uh, the this the commentaries of this was started in the work of Verma and Pearl in the in 1990. And um, and they give a very nice characterization of when two DAG, two DAGs are equivalent. Uh, so that I will not go into. It's a simple calculation, but I'll actually just write down uh, something that came later, which is building upon this Verma and Pearl result. So here is that that calculation. So this is the calculation actually of the essential graphs. So so this is this particular uh, calculation is from an analysis statistics paper from 1997 by Anderson, Madigan, and Perlman, but very equivalent things, slightly differently stated, 
uh, were also present in our, uh, around the same time, the work around the same time of Chickering and Meek. So the calculation of Chickering and Meek are more algorithmic. The Anderson, Maddick, and Perlman is more, as you can see, it's more structural. I will go through it. Uh, so, so depending upon which group you are looking at, one or the other might be more useful. So here is uh, what the Anderson et al. calculation is. So it says that a partially directed graph, G, represents a Markov influence class, if and only if all the three following conditions hold. So the first condition is, it has two new terms. So it says, it says that G is a chain graph. So chain graph means that it is a partially directed graph. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically the, um, is the notion of acyclicity in a partially directed graph. So this means that there are no partially directed cycles. So if I take any cycle in which at least one edge is directed and all the directed edges go in the same direction, that cannot happen. That is not allowed to exist. So, so this is like the, so in a directed acyclic graph, no directed cycles are allowed to exist. Here you say that no partially directed cycles are allowed to exist. So that's a chain graph. And in the chain graph, you can then, it's not so hard to see that in this chain graph, there will be this components of undirected, uh, uh, like country components of undirected vertices. Like, uh, so if you just take the undirected edges, they will form connected components, which will be themselves connected via a DAC. So these undirected components, connected components must be caudal. So, so a caudal graph is an undirected graph in which every cycle of length at least four has a chord. So what does that mean? So that means that the following picture is not allowed. So a square, is not a chordal graph because it's a, it has four nodes and this cycle has no chord, although it's of length four. If I add the chord, now it becomes a chordal graph. Okay, so any cycle of length more than four is not chordal. Um, so that's an example of what is not a chordal graph. And a chordal graph is a graph in which every cycle of length at least four has such a chord. So a chord just means uh, an edge. So if I take a cycle, a, this, a chord in the cycle is an edge between two vertices on the cycle, which are not adjacent along the cycle. So uh, is this fine? And the next two conditions are somewhat more so technical, uh, but they're interesting nonetheless. So one says that this kind of a sub induced subgraph cannot appear where you have A, B, and C. A and C are not adjacent. A to B is a directed edge, and B to C is an undirected edge. That is not allowed. Such a graph, such a com such a thing is not allowed. Further, every directed edge in the graph has to appear as a part of one of the four induced subgraphs. Okay, so so these so one of these subgraphs is basically just like two. So basically, it says that two is not allowed to happen, and uh, it has to be either directed this way, or uh, yeah, it, or the other way, uh, which is also fine. So which is this thing here? So so you get either a so-called V structure. So this is like a V structure, or you get this. You are not allowed to have this. Or cycles. So undirected cycles are not allowed. So if A to C and C to B are present, then so like this one, so this is this is present, then the only direction possible for A to B is A, is A to B, because if B to A was undirected, that would contradict the chain graph condition, because now I would have a, I would, I would have a partially undirected cycle. And similarly, the fourth one is uh, similar in nature. So, so I'll not use these things in detail, this is just to say what kind of uh, combinatorics happens here. So these are graphs which have to satisfy these conditions. So they are partially directed graphs, which have no partially directed cycles, where is, uh, like graphs of A, this A is the sec graph in the second point does not appear. So these kind of graphs don't appear as induced subgraphs. And where every directed edge has to be sort of so-called strongly protected. So these it has to appear as one of these four, as part of one of these four kinds of subgraphs. So this is this is what an essential graph is. And uh, yeah, and so now uh, so our, our goal was to count how many like the sizes of MVCs. So the first problem uh, is to now look at what is the size of an MEC. So the question is just this. You're given a Markov influence class G, so it is represented via this, this uh, essential graph. And you want to find the number of DACs that are consistent with this Markov influence graph. So you're given this partially directed graph, and you want to find how many DACs are consistent with this graph. Okay. So this was actually already considered by me. Uh, so, okay, so, okay, so let, before that, let's just uh, look at this. Uh, so there is, uh, so one statistical perspective of this problem could be what is the size of a typical MEC. I'll come to that later. There are some recent results on this also. So, so in this typical thing, you're going to ask, what does a typical MEC mean? And for at least one notion, there are some answers now in the work of uh, Schmidt and Slide. I'll come to that later. In the most of it will be, most of this talk will be about algorithms. So, so let's look at the algorithm problem. So we have an MEC M represented as essential graph, and we want to output the number of tasks that are consistent with this. Uh, this G should be in. 
So this was first con considered by Meek. Uh, it's the same paper that I alluded to earlier, which gave this characterization. And there's a lot of recent work on this, exploiting various properties of chordal graphs. Uh, so there are some references. And the culmination of this line of work is this very beautiful paper of Vinov, Parnak, and Gieskiewicz from 2021, which gave a polynomial time exact counting algorithm for work. So exact counting algorithms are often usually hard to find because often these exact counting are number P hard. They showed that it's actually this problem is in P. Uh, for any MEC, you can find the number of DAX constriction in polynomial time, size polynomial in the just the number of vertices in the graph. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, result, uh, but um, and it's based on a beautiful augmentation of uh, something called lexicographic breadth for search. I won't say what this is in the class. I would mention something very related called maximum cardinality search later on. Uh, it's a classical tool in the study of chord graphs. It uh, goes back to the work of uh, Rose, Starge, and then Duker uh, from 1976. Uh, and uh, I would just, uh, especially in this conference, I would like to add that LBFS and its cousins, the ones that we will talk about, they look very much like a preferential attachment version of bread for search. Um, so I'll say more about this later. So, but yeah, so I wanted to say the word preferential attachment. But yeah, they do, they do look like preferential attachment. Uh, versions of interest Okay, so this is uh, a question uh, and it has been solved. So what's to do? So here is another question that we already considered uh, in this paper in some way. So it was that if you model uncertainty given uh, observational data is roughly to be modeled as size of the Mark Wilkins class, then there is something else that can also happen that you might have some so-called background knowledge. So the MEC determines some directions in the graph but a few more edges might be known to you for, for, for various reasons. You might have done some experiments on your system, which might have told you that some edge. So for example, in the Markov chain example, so I have this. So if you remember, uh, the MEC could not distinguish between these three graphs. Right. But suppose someone tells me that, uh, that, uh, just uh, one of the edges. So like, yeah, actually in this case, it doesn't help a lot, but so if, some, some, if someone tells me that this edge is directed downwards here, for example, so I, I'm, just, I'm just told this information. Then I know that this edge cannot be directed upwards. It can only be directed downwards. So even by give, just by giving me one extra, some one piece of background knowledge, the number of, so if this was background known, then this is fixed. So the, the so in this case, just giving me one edge, completely fix the M, fix the graph. So it's just telling me that this edge is down is downwards, immediately imposes the direction of the other edge also. Okay. So although in a, although if it was just told, I was just told that this is actually upwards, then it would not have done so. It would have only eliminated one possibility. These two would have remained. Okay. So. So yeah, so, so this background knowledge can have effects on the size of what is what remains consistent in the MEC. And this background knowledge can come through experimental intervention or through domain-specific knowledge. Maybe you know that whatever this part represents and whatever this represents, there's no way that the arrow from can go from B, uh, from B to A. It has to go from A to B. So if you know that, then you know that the arrow from B to C also has to go from B to C, although that was not part of it. So, so yes, so this background knowledge can change the size of the MEC and the problem does appear to be different. In fact, it's very different. It's, uh, uh, so I will say why it's very different. So the problem, but let's first state it formally. So you again, uh, this has to be in. So you are, you are now given an MEC M and the direction of some subset S of uh, under two edges in M. And you want to find the number of DAX that are consistent with both this M and S, okay. So that's the new augmented problem. It's certainly a generalization of the previous problem because S could be empty, then you would have the previous problem. And this problem, we know at all in the same paper, they showed that it's number P hard. So that means that it's as hard as counting solution to Boolean formulas, significantly harder than, significantly harder than just NP hard. So, so, this, so just introducing this extra piece of information does make the problem very hard. Okay. So, so it's, it is a different problem. Okay, so 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 now I can get to my journalistic role. So so and we meet our old friend Vidya Sagar here. Uh, so Vidya Sagar showed that uh, you can somehow sub circumvent this hardness results in certain cases. And here is the main interesting part of his work. So he defined this new parameter, which looks a bit strange. 
at first sight. He says, well, you have this, uh, so this G should be again. Maybe the easier thing to do is to make this. So what he does is that he goes, so you take all the cliques in this graph, uh, in G, and uh, so you don't know, need to know this number. It's, it's, it's just uh, like, so it doesn't actually have to enumerate the cliques, but you take all the cliques in the graph. And for each clique you see, you look at the intersection of the clique with this set of known edges, this S, and see how many vertices are there in that graph. And then you take the maximum of this number over all cliques. So this is a strange parameter. The only nice thing about it is the second point, which is that it's certainly less than twice the size of S, but it can actually be much, much smaller than the size of S. Okay? So it can be much smaller than the number of background knowledge edges that have been told to you, because they might not intersect. The cliques might be small, for example. So, so it cannot be more than the number of words in the maximum peak. And his main result is that if this parameter is small, if this k is small, then you have a fast algorithm, or, or at least a polynomial time algorithm. So the algorithm runs in time, which is exponential in k, so it's k factor to 10k squared. But the runtime bound in terms of size of the graph g is actually just polynomial, so just four. So, so he shows one way of uh, circumventing this hardness result uh, when k is small. So in any, any questions about this, these two results, the Vinox et al. So I hear for the first time about this problem and I have a question that uh, yes. how come that if you know some of the directions, then it is a different problem because uh, if I if I look at it, okay, we have some we have some inferences. We may yeah. we have these uh, ages. Then then if we have ages in both directions, then we make it undirected. But basically, if we start with a different set of inferences, then uh, why is it a different problem? What in in essence, why is it a different problem? Well, because uh, now I'm putting a, so I'm I, I'm allowed to now add another set of constraints. So. I am allowed to give some arbitrary set of set S. So, so MEC is a very uh, structured object, right? It cannot have an arbitrary set of directed edges. So it has to satisfy these conditions that we saw earlier. So here. So the MEC has to satisfy these uh, very structured set of inputs. So it's an MEC input has to be, it has to be a chain graph, country components have to be cordial these kind of induced subgraphs are not allowed to exist, etc. So this MEC has to be like this. This background knowledge can be arbitrary. So I can, someone can come and give me some arbitrary selection of selections. Which, so that's how the hardness result actually comes about. You basically encode uh, uh, finding uh, linear extensions to partial orders into this problem via the background knowledge, because the background knowledge, there's no constraint on it. You might, there's no constraint on which kind of background knowledge you might have. They might come from experiment or they might just come from domain knowledge. You might just know that certain edges are not allowed to be directed in certain ways. So it is a more general problem. It's that even formally, it's a more general problem. And this fact that there's no constraints on where the background knowledge edges can lie makes it significantly harder. This in fact shows up in the hardness result also. That's what drives the hardness rate, the hardness reduction uh, for number P hardness. Also. Okay, okay, thank you. Any more questions? No, you should go ahead. So, so this harness rule can be circumvented at least when k is small. Um, and uh, here is, uh, so this is a very natural problem especially from a computer science perspective, uh, which is, this is one way of circumventing a hardness result. Another way of approximate, uh, circumventing hardness results is to say that, okay, I do not want exact counts. Uh, I don't care whether the number is uh, 1 million or 1 million plus 1. I just want an approximation algorithm, which is, let's say, approximates it to some factor, some reasonable factor. And it's not known, uh, as far as I know, whether there's a polynomial time approximation algorithm for computing the size of an MEC. So these things can exist. There are number of hard problems for which there are approximation algorithms to arbitrary, I mean, to any um, reasonable, like, yeah, say, factor two approximation, factor 1.01 approximation. But if something like this can be done here, uh, it's uh, not clear. Uh, 
uh, and that's the first open question. Uh, their Markov chain kind of techniques possibly might be helpful here. That they are they are usually the tools of choice for designing such approximation algorithm for other number of hard problems, um, the other sharp hard problems. Uh, and uh, but here I will say a few words about some Markov chain related work in this direction. But it's, uh, it seems to be in its infancy. So, so any questions about this problem or any solutions to the problem? <laughs> Okay, so then I'll move to another class of questions. Question. So, so far we were talking about we're given an MEC and maybe some extra information about some extra constraints on what we are allowed to do. And we want to find the number of graphs that are constrained with the MEC and maybe with these extra constraints. Now, uh, another class of questions one can ask, which is how many MECs are there? So the question is where, um, where are you counting them? So there are many, um, many different ways in which this problem has been looked at. So one way of looking at it is to say that you fix a number of variables. Fix, so in my example, there were three variables. You fix the number of variables and maybe even fix the number of edges that are allowed. Uh, and uh, yeah, this bracket is missing. Um, and uh, so and and that has been so, so and so basically you look at these different constraints and try to see. Uh, how how many MECs there can there be? So there are many different kind of solution concepts you could have come up with and try to study to study this problem. One is to just get exact enumeration formulas, recursive formulas. Uh, so that's uh, some uh, old work. Uh, one other way people have tried to do is to, do this is to sample using Markov chain. So this is the work of uh, AG and Q uh, from 2013. So, so this is a paper from Analysis of Statistics, which so there where they propose a Markov chain. The Markov chain has the right stationary distribution. So it's uniform on all MECs, which are with a fixed number of nodes and upper bound of the number of edges. Uh, they don't have any mixing time results as far as I can make out. They have simulation results that the chain seems to do well, but, and it has the right station distribution can be proof, but uh, there's no provable mixing time. Uh, Bernstein and Delali have more uh, studies of similar Markov chains. And so the mixing properties of these chains uh, are not well understood. So that's another wide open question um, of probabilistic nature here. Um, and uh, a third way, which is uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about it later, uh, is to compare the number of MECs with. So this is uh, similar to the exact now in but you know, it says well, what we will do is we'll try to compare the number of MECs with the number of all DAGs on n vertices. Now, so this is slightly unsatisfactory in the sense that you're looking at all DAGs on n vertices. Probably your models are more restricted. Maybe they have to be sparse and so on. Uh, but we'll come to uh, these things later. This, uh, but uh, one interesting thing is that all of these. The uh, things here, all of the proposals here are about just fixing no numbers, numbers of nodes, numbers of edges, and so on. There's a more natural way, in some sense, is to look at the number of MECs with a fixed skeleton, which is uh, you fix the you fix the uh, uh, undeaded skeleton. So you, every so so the MEC has the partially under partially dead graph. You say that. I will only look at uh, the undirected part of it. So I just remove the directions on the edges and I get a graph. So that's an undirected graph. And I want to see how many MECs are there with that skeleton. So just by directing edges in that undirected graph, and of course I have to follow the MEC constraints, how many MECs can I get? So, so is, the, is the question here? Okay, so, so that's uh, a, a question uh, and uh, and somehow uh, it has there's not been much progress on this. Uh, Karen, Caroline Adler's group uh, at MIT had some um, work on rest, understanding this in very restricted settings, often in very special classes of graphs, this trees, uh, especially even special trees like paths and so on. Uh, but any kind of general algorithm uh, does not seem to exist. And there's some recent uh, work again by our old friend Peter Sagar, uh, who gives uh, exact polymer time exact counting algorithm. For graphs of bounded degree and tree width, and this uh, runtime bound. So what does that, what that means? That his runtime bound looks like the following: there's an exponential factor where the exponent is polynomial in the tree width and the degree. It's something like, if I remember correctly, degree to the three and tree width to the power four uh, times the polynomial in the size of the graph. So times g cubed. So this is a, this is a recent thing, uh, and uh, so so that's that's the result. Uh, it's a bit as you can see, it's not, I mean, it's good in the sense that it's more general. It certainly 
so trees are bounded tree width, for example. So it captures bounded degree tree. Um, and it works on all graphs as long as they are bounded tree width. Um, but uh, and bounded degree. Uh, but uh, slightly unsatisfactory thing is I'll come to that later. Uh, so uh, I just say what goes into this result. Uh, it's, it's it requires a lot of uh, combinatorial heavy lifting. Uh, the initial idea is simple. This is a standard idea of trying to do dynamic programming over a 3D composition of a graph. So you, would, if you, have, you have a bounded tree with graph, you compute the 3D composition and try to do dynamic programming over it. And implementing this sort of requires encoding information. So basically, you would have to look at MVCs projected onto these the, the bags in the 3D composition. Um, and uh, then you have to do take this. So this information that you project down, it should be such that it's enough to count the fiber. So basically, how many MVCs are projecting down to what you have on just this small thing. But it should be succinct enough to be enumerated fast. And he does it. Uh, so these are two conflicting requirements in some sense because the information is, should, should be enough to count the corresponding fibers, uh, but should also be small enough that you can just go through all possible values of it quickly. And uh, and so so he, he has this notion that he calls a shadow of a Markov equivalence class uh, on, on on subsets, and these seems to reasonably well capture this information at least well enough to get this kind of a uh, algorithm, which is exponential in the tree width and degree. Um, the so the unsatisfactory thing I was talking about is that the exact complexity of this problem is not known. Usually, you will go try to find such an algorithm which is exponential in tree width degree, etc. If you know that the problem that you're trying to solve is hard, I mean, say at least ten p hard. Uh, we don't. This problem, for all we know, might land in p. Uh, it might be have a, it might have polynomial time algorithms. It's just that this is the best we know so far. So whether it's hard or what are, what are the corresponding hard decisions, we don't know. Um, and again, the same question uh, arises that if, uh, even with, whether it's hard or not, maybe that's a bit hard but <laughs> to figure out. But again, could we get approximation algorithms that are more efficient than this uh, exponential in tree width and degree uh, uh, algorithm? So, so the situation right now is that you you that the best result uh, for this problem seems to be a result which is exponential in tree width and degree. Um, but there is no complex theoretic barrier preventing a fully polynomial time algorithm, uh, and certainly not any barrier getting an approximation algorithm. And it seems like this is a nice question in the sense that even getting to these algorithms requires some nice uh, playing around with the, the commenters of uh, 3D compositions. And the structure of Markov equivalence classes. So, so the, there seems to be a nice commentary is going on here, um, and it should be interesting to resolve either of these two um, questions. Uh, any, any any questions about uh, this problem and its status? Uh, yeah. No, Piyush, go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, so let me uh, uh, so I mentioned uh, this uh, uh, result of Schmidt and Sly uh, very tangentially. Uh, so let me just say what they actually prove. So this is a third kind of question, which is I think completely open. So at least the current problems I've been mentioning are all at least crisply stated. Uh, here it seems like even very conceptual things are missing. Uh, so here is their result. So they are trying. They are interested in the question not in the question of with a fixed skeleton. Although I guess. The same question can be posed in that setup also. So they are looking at the number of Markov stars on n nodes, um, and uh, they want to compare it to the number of DAGs on n. Nodes. So these are all labeled. So you have number. So I have not put the word labeled here, but just your labeled MECs, labeled DAGs. Yeah. Also, changing to unlabeled also works, but let's for simplicity look at label. So, and they show that as the number of nodes goes to infinity, the number of MECs on M nodes, the number of DAGs on M nodes goes to a constant. And it constant is a small number. It's like less than 10 or so, less than 20 or something. Well, that they don't have a proof of that, but simulations by other people suggest that it's less than 20. And, um, and, and uh, so yeah, so this is interesting from various ways. This shows that for most DAGs, I mean, it also says that for uh, like an expectation, if you take a DAG, then its MEC is actually quite small. So these other problems that I was talking about, where these problems were like uh, this polynomial time algorithm for counting and so on. Uh, so somehow for most DAGs, those numbers are going to be actually very small. Uh, 
so if the hardness is coming from the numbers being large, it has to be it has to come from very small sets. So this is often a strange thing. That it might happen that the problem is easy on average. Uh, you know, even the counting problem possibly because there are only few solutions. Although that does not guarantee that the that it's easy because just finding those few might be hard. But at least the numbers are small. So for most acts, the number of elements the MEC would be also be small because just the number of MEC is not too much bigger or not not too different. And uh, uh, yeah, so 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 that so so that that's uh, an interesting uh, uh, kind of result. And uh, but there's one again slightly unsatisfactory thing that it, this is uh, talking about all DAGs on n nodes. So so this is a very rich class, right? And uh, it's, it's just the uniform distribution on all nodes. For applications, uh, you probably want something a more structured random model, not just all DAGs. So for example, sparse models would be so if you are have if you have Bayesian network. If the Bayesian network is just a complete graph, that's not very useful because then why do you have, even have the network? It's just an arbitrary distribution. So the network is more useful. So as I said earlier, uh, the the information in a Bayesian network is contained in which edges are missing. So the sparser the network, the more constraints it is putting on the model. And so sparse models uh, would be more interesting. Uh, so I don't know if their techniques generalize uh, to sparse models. Uh, probably, yeah, it's not clear. Uh, and uh, in fact, a more conceptual question is uh, what are the appropriate random network models for this problem? So what is the appropriate random network model if you want to study Markov reference classes of Bayesian networks? So, so the Bayesian networks are used for modeling things like say genetic uh, things like uh, gene regulatory networks and so on. So in that in that context, what would be the appropriate random uh, probability distribution that one should put on DAX or Markov reference classes to study questions of this kind? So, um, so this is, uh, so yeah, so this, I don't have much to say on this problem. It's just, uh, this paper is also from, I think, last year. And uh, it's, um, yeah, and uh, before that, there are conjectural works of this kind uh, um, and simulations, but this is, I think, the first uh, rigorous proof of this kind of result. So yeah, but uh, coming up with correct models uh, and, uh, and yeah, asymptotics seems to be over. So any question about this? Okay. No, there seems okay. no question. Okay, so then in the last few minutes, uh, let me just give a short glimpse of basic techniques, some of the, this is something. So of basic techniques that are used in some of these results. I will not get kick, so I said there are no proofs, I'll not give any of the proofs, but I'll just uh, mention some of the um, basic uh, caudal graph ideas that go into some of these results. And uh, um, or I, uh, not even the building box, like the foundational box, and try to justify my comment about uh, preferential attachment. So, so just to recap, uh, uh, these Markov equivalence classes were given by uh, this, these constraints. Uh, so let's not worry too much about second and third, but we had this notion of uh, caudal graphs that uh, that somehow the unrecurrent components are these very special graphs which have um, where every cycle of length four must have a chord. So let's just see uh, what these uh, so what about caudal graphs uh, is used often. Uh, so 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 just to recap the definition, of, it's a unrecurrent graph is said to be caudal if every simple cycle of length four or more in the graph is a chord. And the chord just means that, uh, so if I have a cycle like this, so this is not chordal because there are no chords. For example, so it must, this this thing must have a chord. So let me, write, so this thing is a chord, for example, because these are the edge between two edges that were not adjacent along the cycle. So is this graph chordal? It's all, still not chordal because this is not there. This is still not chordal. And uh, now I think it has become chordal. So, so this is the chord graph, um, and uh, and uh, yeah. So 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 that's the definition. Uh, another way of thinking about chordal graphs is in terms of something called perfect elimination orderings. Uh, this name sounds a bit strange. Uh, we have to say a few words where it comes from. So an ordering of vertices of a graph is called a perfect elimination ordering for every vertex. All the neighbors, all its neighbors that precede it in the ordering. Form a clique. Okay. So all the all the so I order the I have to be, be able to produce so a perfect elimination ordering is the ordering of the vertices. So for every vertex, 
all its so if i have so the graph somehow like if, if i put the vertices on uh, i mean they might put the, uh, so on around the line uh, but like I mean, that, that does not mean that the line is embedded in the graph it's just an ordering of the vertices then for example it's not allowed that this has parents just this and this because then these two are not at least so if this is the case then this must also be there okay. so so we thought this to be a perfect elimination ordering of the graph uh, now this is a perfect elimination ordering of this graph and uh, so okay so so the name perfect elimination ordering uh, comes from um, uh, trying to do gaussian elimination actually that's where the name comes from so if you eliminate orders in such a order you do not change the sparsity you do not create new non zero entries so that's where the name comes from that's why it's perfect so the sparsity is sort of kept so that's why that's where that's where some of the interest in this came from uh, uh, in the algorithms on the in the in the numerical analysis and algorithms uh, literature in the 70s and uh, and uh, this is a very nice result that chordal graphs are characterized by perfect elimination order so a graph is chordal if and only if it has a perfect elimination order um, and this fact actually makes many np hard problems on chordal graphs very easy so maximum independence rate maximum rings all of these things become very easy because of existence of perfect elimination order uh, not just existence, but also efficient methods for finding them. And uh, so these methods uh, are basically are often modifications of uh, breadth first search. Um, so the first one was lexicographic breadth first search is the oldest method um, due to Rose, uh, Rose Darge and well, not Rose name I'm forgetting. Uh, and uh, another method called maximum cardinality search. And as I said, they look like preference attachment. So in what way? So I'll just say that uh, in the next slide so so but any questions about the definition of perfect elimination or quarter graphs okay okay so 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 let's uh, so maybe this is the only technical slide in the whole talk um and so about a nice result of Tar tarjan and janet artists so so they so this is much uh, this is at least 10 years or so after the lbfs that got them i think and they propose a simpler algorithm for finding a perfect elimination ordering of a caudal graph, and it's called maximum cardinality search. And here is what it does. This is the full algorithm. You start the breadth first search algorithm from any vertex fix, fix a vertex V in the graph, and start the breadth first search. Now the breadth first search algorithm, so like what does it do? You have, you, you are at a vertex, you put all its neighbors in the queue, and then say that this vertex has been visited. Then you pick something in the queue. Um, so the question is which which what should like sometimes there may be many words in the queue which are sort of equivalent so which one should you pick first so so this one just says that you when you are choosing which vertex to visit next from those in the bfs queue you choose the one which has the largest possible number of neighbors among those which are already visited so it's just uh, Okay, so when choosing which word, so you have so far you have visited a certain number of vertices. Now if there are some other vertices that are in in your uh, uh, sort of candidate vertex to visit next. Among them, you choose the one which has the largest possible number of. I mean, there might be many such, so you choose any one of them, the largest possible number of neighbors among those vertices which have already been visited. Yeah. And so you keep doing this BFS in with just this extra tie-breaking rule. And this order in which now you would visit versus is called the maximum cardinality search order, or the MCS order. And the theorem of Tarjan and Yanakavis, which is somewhat non yeah, yeah, Once it has been told, it's maybe not as hard, but still requires uh, some work, shows that if, if the graph is cordial, then any ordering that such an algorithm produces. So, so of course, this algorithm is not a fully specified algorithm because still there might be many vertices which are uh, which have the same number of neighbors at any any time, any point of time. It says you it doesn't matter. No matter how you break ties in those situations, any of the ordering you produce will be a perfect elimination order. Uh, so, it's, so, so that so that uh, so so that now it starts looking like this attachment kind of a thing where like you, if you as long as you attach to more people, somehow it's the reverse of that. Uh, you produce a perfect elimination order. Uh, one brief thing I would mention, so I did not say anything about learning uh, and uh, coming to the end. So 
is uh, is that these uh, is perfect elimination orderings so there can be many perfect elimination orderings for a quadrant graph and they are not all sort of equivalent for all purposes uh, so uh, one thing for example is that not all of them are a lexicographic best for search or mcs orderings so all this, these things are saying that every mcs ordering would be perfect elimination ordering and such a thing will exist but it's not this this claim is not being made that every perfect elimination ordering can be produced using this algorithm uh, and sometimes it's useful to look at evil, these perfect emission ordering with special properties. Um, and uh, these special properties can become more and more Baroque. So this one, I would not even write on the definition, but uh, there's some project we had where we were trying to learn Bayesian network. So you have just the MEC and you want to learn all the edges. So instead of counting, you want to see how many more experiments of, of a certain kind we have to do to learn the whole network. And in that, um, in that kind of a question, it turns out that a certain kind of Permission ordering called that we call peak block shared parent. Um, yeah, I won't go into the details of that. Uh, turned out to be useful. So these are not all not all permission orderings have this property. And but what we proved is that something with this property would exist. And once you have something with that property, you could do the rest of the learning at all. Rest of the uh, lower bound for the learning algorithm. So these the perfect elimination ordering, the structure of those things is still, I think they're, they're still sometimes people find things which are not known. So which, um, it is interesting you know, to me because it seems like a very um, clean idea from one side. It, there's perfect elimination ordering and quadrant graphs, but there seems still seems to be some mystery going on inside the set of perfect elimination orderings. Um, uh, and as I, I think I mentioned this earlier, also that the Wienhoff sort of their breakthrough result of this getting this polymer time algorithm was actually based on taking the LDFS algorithm and augmenting it, sort of, uh, sort of like extracting more information from it than it gives by default. And Vidya Sagar's work on the background knowledge thing was then based on taking the Wienhoff algorithm and sort of analyzing it carefully uh, with some modifications to see where exactly its bottleneck is, or what is it, what is making the problem hard for it. So, um, so, so these, uh, yeah, so this this perfect elimination ordering, the structure of perfect elimination ordering in graphs, maybe even random graphs, seems like um, something there were still things that left to understand. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm finishing before time, but uh, let's um, summary. So, so there's several interesting network questions regarding Bayesian networks. Um, so I mostly uh, focused on algorithms for counting and sampling. And uh, of course, there are very concrete questions here, like what are the complexities of certain, some of these questions that I wrote down. But there are also very conceptual questions about which, what is the right notion of, uh, what is the right uh, distribution to study these things if you want to study them in an average sense. Uh, so what's the correct choice? And with this choice of random models, what's the behavior of these problems uh, on those random models? Um, and as I said, this is a very biased, a very biased survey. Uh, this is focused on counting and sampling, but there are a whole host of other problems relating to Bayesian networks. Um, so we're getting to Bayesian networks. Um, so one of them is learning Bayesian networks from data. So this is, um, I partly refer to one work that we had done, but there, this is a very, very active thing with like very different notion, different solution concepts and so on. So too many references to this. This is not a really take error. This is a, I wrote. And, um, and uh, the other one uh, is causal inference. This again, I did not talk about. So everything I talked about where was where all the variables are known to you. Um, the causal inference problem, there will be some confounding variables whose existence you know, but whose values you cannot access. So you are seeing some kind of a marginal of a larger page network. That's your observed data. And from that, you want to do inference of, of causality and so on. So this is also a very well-studied uh, uh, well studied problem. Uh, Julia Pearl has also a book uh, which uh, discusses it in at various levels of detail. It also relates uh, to certain the notions in uh, information theory, such as direct mutual information, uh, some notions in uh, which through which it also relates to things like Granger causality in economics and so on. But there are also some one specific question in this area that I've been studying, which is, interesting, which is that you can you know, do this theory sort of in a logical way, in a uh, in a symbolic way. So where you write down symbolic expressions for when you can do causal inference, and when you cannot write down those expressions, you prove that those expressions don't exist and so on. But these expressions in the end have to be numbers have to be plugged into them. You'll be 
putting probability distributions that you have learned or estimated into those. And these will have errors. They will not be perfect. They will not follow all the condition and dependence constraints that are imposed with a model perfectly. And these errors can accumulate in different ways. Um, and uh, the, so the question is how much, like how do they accumulate? They can accumulate in very bad ways. Um, so that was the content of the first of these papers. And since then, the problem has been studied not a lot, but uh, a little bit in various models. Um, and there are methods to look at what uh, stability is. It turns out numerical stability also relates to graphical stability. So uh, if your model is stable to numerical uh, perturbations of this kind, like noise in the data, under certain uh, assumptions, it's also uh, stable to perturbations in the model itself. Like maybe you have missed the edge and still, as long as your model, your inference process was stable, it will remain stable. So the results of this kind that are known. Um, and so with that, I will end. And so these views can also be, for example, explored in case of random networks. And so, um, but, uh, but the story here is still, uh, for the stability question, still starting out. So, um, uh, so even for the non-random case, things are the, not fully um, fleshed out. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Is some quick questions? Okay. And thank you for this talk. Um, when you say correct choice of random models, does the yeah. learning of Bayesian networks from data tell you something about what the structure of these models should be, what properties they should have? Otherwise, it's going to be extremely difficult to come up with a good random model, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so um, learning, learning from data, usually you would, you would already put some constraints. So you would already say things like the my network is bounded or bounded degree or because uh, you cannot, uh, yeah. So 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 so, so it has to do with the stability question also because you will not get perfect data. So you get some data. Usually it will be generic. So generic data will not have any Bayesian cons. So so it's okay. So, so so what I'm saying is this. So suppose your your model was actually very simple, but then you do some measurements. So you will get some perturbation. So you will get some probability distribution, which is actually a perturbation of the correct. Now so this has become a generic object now. It is it will not likely to respect any of the constraints imposed by your model. It's only suppose it will only be doing this approximately. So the learning problem itself would have to start with some assumptions that the data probably did come from a bounded degree model or uh, or or bounded degree bit model. So these kind of constraints people put in various theoretical assumptions, or they might have background. Uh, they might have their. Uh, um, so if they're doing, for example, so there's some things where they're doing, say, weather modeling or modeling pixels in an image, then it has to have some geometric locality of edges. So so these kind of constraints are already put into the learning process. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so the learning problem, you already put some constraints of those kind in. So the correct choice of random models probably also has to bring in. So, 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 yeah, so in the correct choice, um, uh, yeah, I should say, Confess that I don't know what would be a correct choice, but uh, the current choice is just uh, all DAX, which certainly is probably um, too rich. Or, yeah, so there should be something more specific. That's not clear which, which will be the best one. <laughs> okay. uh, any more short question? Uh, okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again and thanks, Piyush, uh, for the lecture. And uh, uh, there is an uh, there is some coffee and maybe cookies uh, outside. So yeah, we'll take a break and we'll meet uh, five minutes past twelve. So twenty minutes break. Okay. Thank you, Piyush. Thank you. Thanks.